Simon, everyone. Uh, thanks for your support. And it's great to have so many people uh, here in this first year, first episode of the Betfair Exchange Pro Live series. Uh, I contacted Matt and Mark to be on the first episode um, as, I guess, traditional form students uh, and video analysts forming the, the basis of how they do the form. Uh, as we explore the different players that are on the exchange, um, I think that the Pro Live series aims to look at, you know, what makes Betfair. Betfair really is just a piece of technology or a, uh, you know, a third party. Uh, and it's the players and the customers opinions, uh, which form the markets. And, and from that, we can understand a lot about how the market thinks um, and try and, I guess, theorize on why, why certain horses will firm or why they might sort of blow. So that's a little bit of context to what we're going to try and do in the Pro Live series, as well as showcasing, I guess, the talent and the lives of the, the players who have succeeded in terms of understanding the markets, I guess, um, and work with them every day. So welcome, Mark Lamborn and Matt Taylor. Cheers. G'day, mate. <laughs> How good are you? Hey, Mark. Thanks, good Luke. To... G'day, Matt. So I think the format um, of what we'll do is pretty much, um, you know, look at each of you, each of you guys and your experience um, with Betfair at an early stage and how you sort of stumbled across Betfair. Then we might look at you know, how it's influenced the market uh, and I guess the future of where you see Betfair going. Then we might dissect um, some market moves and look at some replays. Um, you know, again, depending on our ability to handle the tech, but sort of looking at you know, when a horse is off the map or really firm on the exchange, do the fixed odds react a certain way? Uh, does the horse usually follow a certain you know, style or pattern uh, in running? Um, we'll explore different sort of concepts and theories. We'll answer Q&A questions consistently through the session. Um, we'll try and make this as interactive as possible. Um, this is fully live, fully unedited. Um, so, you know, you have got access to, to really good form students. Um, and yeah, we'll see how we'll go and we'll hopefully fill an hour. So Mark Lamborn, we'll start with you. If you could tell us a little bit about your experience with Betfair, you know, at, at an onset. Yeah, I can remember sitting down uh, with Terry Griffin, coffee shop in Plumer Road, uh, Rose Bay, uh, Berners-Gonies. And we were discussing Betfair at the beginning of 2003. It was the most exciting thought in the world. I went, oh, wow, finally, we've got a platform that we can use to play with. A little did I know that uh, the authorities were mobilising, you know, as we sat there to chat about Betfair, because obviously, um, you know, people had been, uh, attendances had been dwindling and the, uh, the on-track on betting ring was starting to thin out. Uh, and suddenly you went, wow, here's the way to do it. Uh, we'll attract punters and players from, uh, from around the globe to actually, uh, you know, all come together in, uh, in an exchange. Seemed like, seemed like all my Christmases had come at once. Do you remember, was there a lot of, you touched briefly on it there in terms of resistance from authorities? I know in the early days of Betfair, um, they definitely struggled in regards to we were licensed originally out of Tasmania. Um, and, I, and I remember I was talking to, I think, Graham Gibson um, and in terms of the early days and he was discussing how he, he was holding workshops and then they were being cancelled at racetracks as turf clubs try to hold out this thing that was the global exchange. Do you remember any sort of resistance? Oh, it was, uh, it was, it was mobilised quite quickly and um, it, it, was, it was very religious in tone. It was, uh, here's this evil devil that's uh, come to... Um, to upset the uh, the great set uh, system that we have in place, uh, that system being the Parry Mutual, actually, um, you know, basically feeding and funding the racing industry, and um, you know that had been a successful funding model, but there was absolutely no appetite to look at uh, at any new entrance into the game. Uh, it was just um, uh, man the battlements. So yeah, Betfair was pilloried um, officially. Um, and still is. I mean, it, you know, there was a lot of a lot of that resistance that uh, that was built up very quickly. Has uh, you know, still still exists in um, many sectors of the um, of the the the, the, um, the establishment when it comes to racing. I, I understand you sort of cut your teeth in the Sydney betting ring uh, with Peter Todd. Um, was he one of the main players? Like what? time period what did the Sydney ring look like in terms of the big players and what were their opinions on Betfair in the early days well I think the the, the most exciting thing that uh, Betfair offered was um, the prospect of 
all runners being fleshed out, you know, what price, what is the true price of every runner? And obviously when you've got a, a fixed odds a betting system, you're, not, you're never sure whether the horse that goes from uh, $11 to $26 has actually found its mark, has found its place in, in the market. You know, is that the true SP? And so suddenly we had this idea that visually you would be able to see where everything fitted together uh, come jump time. Um, for mine, that was that was mind blowing. I, I was so excited at that prospect. And of course, you know, we've we've sort of limped through the last fifteen or so years, desperately, you know, seeking the liquidity that will um, that will, you know, that obviously back in the early days we were privy to to what was going on Betfair UK, and we saw these uh, massive amounts of liquidity, and you know, runners were just, you know, they'd found their uh, found their price. Um, and and you know moved in um, in small increments very slowly. Whereas uh, you know we've still got a situation in Australia where there's lots of races struggling for liquidity, and you know Betfair have, ha have had to sort of try, try and stay ahead of the uh, of the of the regulators that have constantly brought in new measures that may have made Betfair less and less viable. Mm. I guess I've always seen the Australian sort of betting landscape as quite unique as you we've got a strong exchange, you know, the, obviously the development of, you know, fixed odds corporate bookmakers, and then you've got the parimutuel of the toad. At the point Betfair was introduced, what was the state of the parimutuel? Like now we see it declining. Was it really strong? And is Betfair saying that sort of sucked money out of it? Or did you see the decline of the toad as being, you know, already had happening? Well, the, the, the toad has always needed other markets to arbitrage off. So, you know, the, if, if you imagine a situation where it was just the tote, the holdings would be much, much, much smaller because there's no other market to move against. There's no, there's, there's no, uh, there's no guide for the paramutual. So, um, you know, from my point of view, uh, straight away, it was, uh, you know, the existence of another tool was only going to enhance the paramutual. Of course, we've seen the paramutual be cannibalized by the tab uh, by trying to shift, uh, paramutual players into the fixed odds market. So, I mean, they've basically been responsible for the diminishing um, paramutual pools. Mm, I think I agree definitely with your comment there that they all should coexist and a strong betting sort of ecosystem runs off a strong exchange, strong fixed odds with good limits will result in a healthy toe. Um, why do you think administrators and regulators don't share that view? Well, it's just short-sightedness. It's, it's, here's another player. There's a limited um, uh, gambling dollar. Um, you know, you're cutting into our share, basically. So, yeah, there isn't that vision that um, the livelier marketplace will generate more and more turnover, which it actually does. You know, yeah. if there's no opportunities, there's not going to be any, 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 any wagering. So you, you've actually got to create an op you've got to set it up so that there will be opportunities uh, particularly arbitrage opportunities, you know, in a, in a, a lowly taxed, um, vibrant marketplace, arbitrage will, you know, will be a, a, a huge bulk of, um, of the holdings. Yeah, fascinating. Uh, Matt Taylor, obviously, hey. uh, yeah, young form student, um, you sort of, I guess you've seen the, or the development of Betfair and corporate bookmakers and struggling to get on as you've developed yeah. your love for the form. Yeah. What was your first sort of experience with a betting exchange Betfair? Yeah, well, I definitely wasn't uh, a full-time punter or a pro punter when Betfair came out. So I was um, through the uh, racing rants at a fan base or punter show as they were. I was basically learning just to bet tote and, um, and fixed odds. And, mm. and basically I was just sort of, looking at Betfair, not really knowing what the hell it was. I was just trained in my head, you know, take a fixed price and try and beat the market sort of thing. So to me, Betfair early was just a measuring stick to sort of how I, um, how I was sort of my fixed odds bets went. Mm. And then sort of, you know, you may take some bad prices, you start to throw some money in on the exchange. And, you know, every time you've taken a bad price, you might try and top up on Betfair on those horses and, yeah, real experimenting sort of uh, stage. But um, yeah, at first, uh, hard to get your head around. But um, yeah, it's uh, I've sort of uh, over the years, as I've said in some of my articles for you guys, I've sort mm. of changed the way I bet. And um, I guess, yeah, Betfair is almost my go-to play now in regards to turning over most of my money. Yeah, mm. interesting. I, I think, um, well, I guess 
I would like to know what you guys think. As it's getting harder to get on, oh, that's the, the narrative that's sort of put out, that fixed odds limits aren't enough for what sort of punters want at a certain price. Do you see naturally the market gravitate towards the exchange? Um, you know, what's, what's your opinion on the, the future prospects of something like liquidity based off what's happening in fixed odds at the moment? Um, yeah, well, I don't know. Like it's sort of, yeah, the narrative about not getting on is interesting, but I think what people are saying when you can't get on is, um, I guess you say smaller um, players who just specialise in certain areas might see a, um, you know, if they're very organised, which a lot of these people are, they'll see a price go out, you know, two days before. Um, let's say it's gone up eleven dollars, and they go, well, you know, I could get on maybe to win three or, or you know, three or four thousand or something like that. Mm. But they, I don't know, they can't get on more than that. The fact is, you can get on a hell of a lot fixed odds on race day, especially at nine o'clock. Yeah, you, know, you can get on to win twenty grand if you if you bet that big mm. easily, even into one thousand dollar markets. But um. Yeah, I mean, what it's done is not being at like things getting sharpened up earlier. Because mm. I sort of, as people who may know how I do my form, I sort of spread my bit my eye around a few states, which means I can't be ready to go straight away when all the markets come out. So it's easier for me just to wait to scratch things are done. Mm. Track bias is established on the day, and then my day will just start commence at sort of mm. midday one o'clock. And I'll mm. just start chipping away on, on Betfair depending on what I'm left with. Mm. Like obviously a lot of horses that, um, you know, I wanted to back maybe I could have backed a day or two before I hadn't even looked at what fixed price they were. So, mm. I, you know, I may have missed that big, you know, overs that the bookies gave out. Mm. But now all of a sudden my selection B and C uh, bets, their overlays as you call them on Betfair. But mm. at the time when the fixed odds came out, so... I guess in answer to your question, um, yeah, like I can now bet a lot if I wanted to in regards to like every race on the day or every second race because of Betfair because mm. the markets are just swinging around so rapidly. Mm. Um, we may talk about it uh, today, but, you know, a lot of things are overbet. Mm. And so, you know, once something's overbet, you just have to realise you may have missed, if you did like that horse, you just have to, realize you've missed it mm. and maybe uh, your selection B and C have all of a sudden become bets. And mm. that's, yeah, I have to back B and C and it doesn't really matter. Like if B and C are good bets, I'll, you know, they're good bets and I'll have them. It doesn't matter that I've missed out on my top selection. Mm. It's, it's, now. it's quite an interesting point. You, uh, Matt raises their mark, which I've heard, you know, I understand that's probably what you would have thought maybe 12 to 24 months ago, but I have heard you in recent interviews sort of discuss the idea of that's the right one or the one you want to be on rather than going for huge value. Do you want to clarify, you know, some of your points around that, that concept? Well, I may have suggested that, um, you know, it, it, it is semi was sort of acceptable to say mark a horse $3 and then take two eighty. Mm. Um, that's not, uh, that's not really my main thrust, but what I would suggest is that when you look at a market, that is the market, just please, block out of your head anything that's gone before because basically your your task is to assess that market and and the options available in that market without any reference to what prices horses may have been i think the um the uh, situation where you talk about being able to get on i i, I think that this narrative about not being able to get on is a little bit tinny but what it's really about is the fact that yes, you can get on for a certain amount, but the, most of the markets are between 120 and 130 percent. So, the likelihood of that being a market that's attractive to you is is unlikely, really. If we go back, if we reference the um, the the vibrant um, racetrack markets of the past, they were always when the bookies were, you know, when you could pretty much scan the prices and get down to 100 or or below 100 percent. So. Mm-hmm. That, that's the advantage of Betfair is that when it, when it does get happening and uh, it does get liquid, um, it's an attractive place to look at because the prices are, you know, pretty much in line with uh, the sort of prices you want to be taking because most of us are doing 100% markets and, and the thought that, you know, we can somehow find an attractive option in a 120% market and bet up is sort of unlikely. Yeah, I understand. I think it's interesting you, you touched on market percentages then. Um, and I just want to sort of pick your brain a little bit more around that concept. 
um, if we didn't have a strong exchange such as Betfair in Australia, what do you see happening to corporate bookmakers and their book percentages? Yeah, well, I think I, I think it's um, without Betfair, you you know, maybe the bookies would be even safer with their prices. Like um, a lot of the times at the moment, you see the bookies they're putting up a sort of a couple of horses quite safe and they'll put them up really, really safe to start off and just allow it to drift and drift and, and meet, reach its sort of mark sort of thing. They'll know, I think even when I was starting out taking my punting seriously, mm. you used to get, um, you know, like you're looking at dynamic mm. odds, for example, you used to see um, the tab go up a horse $6 and bet 365 go up $4 and sports bet go up $8. And really? all of a sudden there was like this real... I think it's what the synthetic hold you guys yeah, have yeah. I've mentioned before, but um, there used to be that variance in um, prices that were available. Mm. But um, yeah, now they're going to go. I find the bookies, you know, if someone goes up short, they'll just sort of copy it and blah blah blah. And by the time we come race day, they've sort of just they realise who the punters want to want uh, want to back mm. because they have a fear a theory that. A lot of their, well, it's true. A lot of their clients, the majority, aren't too price sensitive. Mm. So they'll just get a feel for what horses their clients are going to back and just keep them safe. And the rest, they'll just go, oh, we'll just leave them alone. Uh, with the exchange coming down to like 104% or whatever, yeah. it forces them to, well, I guess it gives them confidence to be able to blow horses a little bit in their market. Mm. But I think if it wasn't for that, they would just keep, um, I think they'd keep even those roughies a little bit firmer than what they already are. Mm. Um, and therefore, sort of, it gives us a better opportunity to have, yeah, bet into better percentages for sure. I think so. Have you seen that behavior shift, Mark, over, you know, let's just say a 20 year period? Has that phenomenon that Matt, is talking about have you, have you seen that yeah so you only have to see what happens to the markets every time bet betfair goes down or betfair is um is 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 not available for whatever reason um mm -hmm. the best example was the warnable carnival a couple of years ago where i think it was was a day three that betfair went down and um okay. book, the book <laughs> the bookies lost their lead mm -hmm. uh I think it was particularly hard on on course bookies in, on that occasion. I mean, the corporates are running their own race in the sense that their model is let's work out how to get the customer base we want mm. and uh, and take it from there. So all that Betfair or all that uh, Betfair with some volume is doing is highlighting how uh, restrictive those corporate markets are. Um, and, you know, thank God for it, of course, um, because mm -hmm. it is a situation where you, um, you get op opportunities that, uh, that, that the marketplace wouldn't have offered otherwise. Yeah, and I, I did work at a corporate bookmaker, which was um, extremely important in my education, I think, to becoming a punter. And, mm -hmm. um, yeah, basically management, and not necessarily my direct race manager, but further up the chain, they basically don't want the traders to be making, taking any opinions, you know. So without Betfair, we just have to, we followed Betfair basically. That mm. was our, that was our, our role. And I think all the corporates now would have a very similar um, path that, um, you know, you'd never see a horse over Betfair on um, the fix on fixed odds, that's for sure with the corporates, even though someone there may think that horse is too short or too long. Mm. But, um, the management really up high don't want traders to take risks that can't be sort of measured at least that way if the bookies if, if they get hammered on a horse come monday when the accounts are looking at the at the p l for the weekend mm. we can say look every, we were the same price every other bookie we were half a point under betfair that's they're happy to sort of take losses in that regard if if, if a corporate's pushing a horse ahead of everyone else and that half horse happens to win but they just don't cop that anymore because mm. the guys that um make those decisions aren't proper gamblers they're accountants like an accountant mm. mentality which is um frustrating yeah i think it's it's a poor outcome for the industry when you've got you know books as big as tab court would have having the retail license like they would have mm. they're, so, they're positioned so well to make an opinion where they could bet over bet fair on a on a favorite they haven't got in and really make a statement throughout the market 
Mm. Uh, how have you seen bookmaking change on course? Um, has, has it followed the same path, Mark, as to the, the corporate bookmakers? Or do you think the on course guys are still having a crack? Uh, it, mainly the former. Um, what happened was as soon as uh, bookies were able to, to, to watch Betfair on course, they watched it slavishly. And it's quite insane to think that, you know, there can be $25 sitting in there and that is controlling the uh, the, the price for a number of um, fixed odds players. It's uh, mm. it, Look, the bookies are bewitched by Betfair um, mm. and that you would, they have, I, I suppose... It is the sort of game that's quite, the bookmaking is quite a negative, um, um, there's the negative feel to, to bookmaking. And so no one's really addressed the idea of, well, let's, let's, show, let's show Betfair that it doesn't have any clothes. Because, I mean, let's face it, when, there's, when there is a small um, turnover, when, when, you know, when the volume is small on Betfair, I mean, it, you know, who's to say that that is, that is you know, where the price will trend? It's... Uh, we're yet to see any sort of market leading uh, market leadership from any fixed odds players, be they corporate or on course. Yeah, and that's the I think that's the beauty of Betfair. For for now, we realise what Betfair is doing, and the beauty about it is that anyone who's smart and has a good idea about sort of their own price about what a horse should be, you know, you have to realise that other punters are playing games on on Betfair to um, get horses out or to you know get horses in and stuff like that mm. so any canny small punter can just realize that well that's not right and pick it off and hopefully within four or five minutes um once the sort of the big money the real money comes in what you call it the two minutes of truth or whatever yeah, yeah. you've made the right call there and you go that was a bluff and stuff like that mm. and and yeah, the bookies on course and everywhere else are following that fair mm. in that little period. So if you know what you're doing, um, it's a good time to bet. Mm. The there's, a fair, there's a fair amount of the blind leading the blind in, yeah, that, uh, in that particular yeah. period. Yeah, mm. exactly. Well, I guess that's an interesting statement and it probably leads us to our next point. How accurate is Betfair? Is it at the moment if a horse is six to four on Betfair and you know, six to four of the corporates, do, is that the, are you saying that's the right one? Well, it, it depends on the, the state of play. Um, it need, needs to be quite close to jump time to actually, you know, assess that um, the validity of that particular price. Um, obviously, yeah, there is a. I th I think that um, it depends on where the meeting is being held. Um, I think I think that the errors in the market tend to be, say, fifteen minutes out for a, a relatively high volume metro race. And maybe five minutes out for a provincial race, and even you know two minutes out for a country race, where no one has really staked their. Well, the larger players have not really had their say yet, so everyone's in a sort of a, a bit of a, a stasis, a, a, a point of stasis where the market seems right, it looks all right, but it hasn't been tested yet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and I think I've touched on that before for Betfair, but I think. If you back every even money favourite in every race across Australia, you would collect one in two times. Yes. Like, I think that is correct. But what it isn't correct, if you're a small punter and you just pick off the times that even money horse should be a dollar eighty or a dollar seventy, you will you can still beat that even money. Yeah. Sort of. Um, so it's about picking off for small punters. It's about picking off the times for you to um, jump in. Mm. But in regards to backing every horse at, at $10, you know, across Australia every day, that $10 is correct. You will sort of, you'll always break, you know, even one in 10 sort of return, mm. I think. So. Yeah, I think it's pretty optimistic what sort of Matt's saying there. And it comes from, I guess, experience too. Mm. Matt's saying, you know, a small player or a medium-sized player, which is creating markets to 90 or 100%, can still win on the exchange. Mm -hmm. um, it's definitely not easy and it requires discipline and patience. But there are bets there where if you can say, okay, this horse is, a little soft for the following sort of reasons and yeah. you can still create value in your head. Yeah. Uh, you definitely can still win on there. I think. Yeah, exactly. You know, the only way to re realize that you can beat that fair is to measure your decision making. Mm -hmm. um, and that's obviously, yeah. Taking, having, um, you know, Excel spreadsheets and recording your bets, working out what your angle was. Uh, did you beat the market? Did you not? And measuring mm -hmm. that. If you can't measure it and you think you're going to beat it, you know, 
you don't you don't know until you've got enough you know 100 or 200 or 300 sample sizes of different decisions you make mm. but um and i think there's a trend in the accuracy of betfair that i've noticed changing over the last year or so i, I used to think the the sort of the late dip you know we used to call it call it the betfair worm if you, if you were watching dynamic odds that used to to me that used to be like an arrow this horse is going to run a great race, right? Yeah. I think that dynamic has changed over the last maybe six months. Mm. I don't think those horses that firm late um, are that sort of great indicator of mm. um, able to jump in and, and make profit on those horses. I think that dynamic has changed. Mm. But at the end of the day, SP will, will be, still be correct. Yes. I'm just saying when those, that time is changing in regards to it used to be a finger saying this is a great time to bat this horse, you can still make some profit. I mm. don't think that's the case. Mm. I think um, I think punters trying to follow that late dip, you'll you'll lose mm. uh, before you may have been able to break break even or something like that. Mm. But um, yeah, overall market percentage will still be the same and, mm. and correct, but it's not a great guide maybe late as what it was maybe 12 months ago or six months ago. Mm. That's just a feeling I have. Yeah, it's an interesting point sort of Matt raises. And I guess it's, uh, it's an anecdote as in it's, it's we're not backing this up with you know his 12 months worth mm. of data i think what we will do for everyone that's in this session and will be in the future pro live sessions i'll get a variety of different players um guys that are purely mathematical and they'll tell you that if a horse is two dollars on betfair why it is two dollars on betfair and why you can and can't back it and the accuracy of it long term so we will hear from a number of different approaches and that's i guess is the idea yeah. of how everyone plays into this market uh, and what makes it so dynamic uh, in what, at the moment, I would say is a pretty stale sort of wagering yeah. no, sort of landscape. As Luke said, everyone edge is different. Every mm. way everyone does, the, you know, you guys have a lot of data players and a lot of um, sort of smart people with models and stuff like that. Mm. that that's definitely not my go. I'm, I'm yeah. very visual, um, a bit look, look and feel, and that, yeah. that'll work for someone like that. Yeah. My sort of theories that I've just put forward probably don't work in a, a model and a systematic sort of point of view. So yeah. don't, it, you just have to, everyone will, will interact with Betfair differently depending mm. on their skill set. Mm. I think we've got a question uh, and I would uh, share it to the audience. Feel free to uh, type into the Q&A box and we'll go through slowly and answer as many as possible. We've got a question from Tom, which did relate on what we've just talked about a little bit. So we might answer it briefly. Uh, Tom says, I know you've touched on it, but it seems like the markets are getting it wrong more than ever. A comment around that. Is there a snowball effect? Are drifters overstated and firmers overplayed? Mark Lamborn, any comment? Oh, absolutely. And uh, that's that's the beauty of it. Uh, you watch horses go from $3 to $4.60, um, you know, in the last five minutes. And uh, if you were in a, a purely paramutual and fixed odds environment, you would you might find those horses drifting from $2.80 to $3.50. But the, uh, the movement is accentuated because mm. uh, Betfair is the place for layers to congregate. I mean, there is no, ma no other means uh, to, to actually take an a a position against a horse, um, you know, aside from being incredibly nimble and managing to bet around that particular horse. Um, so that's where the layers are. And I would, I would suggest that... Um, Patience is a virtue when it comes to uh, particularly those horses uh, on the fair in the last five minutes of betting. It's um, look, the every day is is full of um, you know excessive blowers and by ver by definition excessive firmers. Mm. Yeah, comment. No, no, exactly what I said before. Like you just can never take your eye off the ball with bet fair. Um, you know, a horse might be put up that you like, might be short all week with the fixed odds operators. Um, it might be short, short, short. You might think, oh, I'm not playing this race. And all of a sudden, um, some big players might back around your horse. Mm. And all of a sudden, it's in play. And, and it's, it's game on. It's a positive um, bet. But, mm. um, yeah, having the, uh, the time and being organised to be able to watch all your runners on the day is um, the key to that. But, yeah, I mean, in regards to the question, yeah, people do concentrate on that top end of the market that I said, you know, they get over bet and that worm that I talked about isn't necessarily making profits anymore. So mm. you just got to ignore the worm and um, sometimes when at the right time mm. and um, back things that are blown out a little bit too far, but that's the beauty of Betfair because as Mark said, the fixed odds guys will just keep a horse 
you know, three twenty, but it might be out to four dollars or four sixty on Betfair at the end, and mm. you can get on uh, plenty for that. Mm. I know you guys do. You both of you guys, sorry, do a lot of form and spend plenty of hours on the meetings per week. I know Matt's doing, you know, six hours a day of videos when I speak to him. He loves it, and he's doing plenty of review work constantly. I thought it might be an interesting opportunity, and probably something I haven't seen. You know, definitely in the racing media, we haven't done it before. Let's look at some betting trends um, of past meetings. Um, then we, I'll try and share my screen. We'll look at the run. Um, and maybe before the run, if you could sort of theorise or discuss why you saw this move or what you think is sort of going to occur. Um, obviously, the race has been run, so there is a little bit of bias in there. Oh. Um, but I guess if you could try... We're certain, to be, we're certain to be correct. Yeah, we'll be experts, exactly. I think everyone on Twitter knows that they're experts after the race. Yeah. I'll get this one right. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So bear with us, guys. I'm going to try and go back to a meeting on the 15th, uh, which was two Saturdays ago at Ramwick. Look at race one. Uh, the favourite was All Saints Eve. Um, really soft on Betfair late. Um, J-Mac rode it from barrier one. So just bear with me. Share screen. Okay. Let's go. So we're going to share screen three. Yeah. Alrighty. I think if someone can just put in the chat box, if I can see that, I think they are. Yeah. So here we go. We're looking at dynamics here. Uh, Randwick race one. All Saints Eve is the, the horse in question. We look at the betting all morning. Yeah. So really well supported um, from about, you know, post scratchings. So 10 o'clock onwards. Uh, it's pretty solid. Um, I guess it held its price, didn't it? But then we look from basically 11 o'clock and they went right on with it up to jump time. Yeah. Was do, that, do, you, do you recall the race? Uh, yeah, yeah. It's that um, a lot of movements these days you see now, like between 8 a.m. and 9 a.m. Mm. Um, that horse was sort of part of that. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, it's just another new variable that's sort of coming out. There's people that can get on to win as much as they like between 8 and 9 o'clock mm. and knock off some prices. Mm -hmm. And then... I guess what we're seeing here is that late Betfair was saying well, that was a little bit too extreme with all Saints Eve and it pushed it back out at the end. Yeah, so we see here Vitesse um, is really solid. I mean, they're almost taking... Yeah, Vitesse the is the one that is the worm. Yeah. And also Saints Eve is the one that's going the other way. Yeah. Mark, any comment on the race uh, and the possible move? So I guess we're saying here from looking at the trends, resistance on all Saints Eve which I, I would say would be a popular runner. Like you've got J-Mac, you've got Barrier One. Um, you know, why wasn't this solid? Yeah, so uh, back in the, the, the Paramutual, when Paramutual was king, uh, All Saints Eve is the sort of horse that would go up $1.50 on the tote. And uh, bookies would be trying to take advantage of the, the perception that this was a, uh, you know, that, that by offering, say, $1.80 or $1.90 or $2, that they were betting, you know, um, a value price but this race is a four manless dream because you've got a race where uh, there's an uncontested leader there's a very very obvious leader in number six uh, and there's a favorite that's resuming and um, you don't need a lot of experience in the racing game to realize that there there is quite often very very strong resistance to horses that are first up so you know they they may be fit, but the point is they're not seasoned, um, particularly once you're talking about slightly more exposed horses. Um, All Saints Eve is lightly raced, but uh, a four-year-old mare resuming. She was also resuming on what was a pretty wet track. So there was going to be a... Doubles down on a heavy track. Right? Yeah. It's, yeah. it's a double tick. For so the... it's a tough assignment from barrier one for the resuming favourite. Uh, hence the softness, I guess is that's the yeah, that's the takeout. Absolutely. Now let's watch the race. All Saints Eve, which is soft in the market. It's, it hasn't got, you know, it's not a savage drift, but it's definitely yeah, I mean, I think it's a good example because um, this horse was first up and the I guess those guys that watch trials and stuff mm. like that, they're the guys that influence the sort of markets early. Mm. So they're they're seeing this 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 thing's gonna sprint sort of thing. Mm. And then late in the betting you get the um, the models and the, the robots, whatever you want to call them, come in and say, no, we like race fitness and on yeah. the speed. And, that, and that's where this market has shifted around. Mm. Do you see that as a common trend throughout many markets? Yeah. Is there often, you know, over back the video horse? Yeah. Here comes the on speed exposed horse, which you or the traditional forms you might look to try and take on. Yeah. Yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah, I think um, those semi-pro sort of players and the guys that um, 
I guess, tip and have sort of opinions and subscribers and whatever. Mm. Like there's mm. so many different guys that just they they don't have the model sort of process in the, in their head. They yeah. they see something exciting from the trials or they the horse may run great first up last time or something mm. like that. Mm. That's good enough for them to say there's value in that bet. And mm. I'm not saying they're wrong. Mm. But um yeah, and they influence the market early. And mm. then late on Betfair, you see the um, you see the I guess the models and the big powerful model sort of syndicates influence the market back to the way that they do their form. Yeah. And the beauty is everyone needs to jump in at the right time that suits their sort of um, ability as a punter. Okay, let's watch this race. I'm going to put it over and then uh, mm -hmm. basically see what happened. Does that come up for everyone? Yep. Well, this uh, yeah, you seen that? Yeah, maybe just put it on a big screen. How is it? Is it looking all right? Uh, you probably well, it's it's going okay. Yeah, it's it's um it's working right. itself out. Yeah. Okay, so here's J Mac. Yeah, so there's the, the there's the, the test. The horse that was really strong on the bet, bet fair late, um, jumping to the front, and um, you know it's getting a pretty. Good time of it, you would say. Mm. And that. Um, do you have figures from the race? Is this a slow tempo? I do. I do. Um, I guess, did you see Vitesse getting an easy lead like this, Mike, pre race? Well, you know, it's funny that you picked on this race because this is one of my biggest play races of the month. Um, okay. I managed to get a, uh, a multiplier on tab and ended up with, after scratchings, 5.6 Vitesse. Wow. And I put it all back at uh, as as low as two ninety two. Yeah, well, so you so, see, he pops off the fence here. Probably this stage thinks he's going better than the test. I'd say. Yeah, yeah. yeah and obviously, they're finding the outside fence too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe that assisted the run. Like, well, I think that the um, the riders perhaps surprised the market there because the market suggested that the. That they would actually stick to the rails, okay. um, and that you know, All Saints Eve having barrier one was a small issue, and uh, you know the leader would because um, it, it is a bit harder for a leader when they actually race wide on the track. It's um, it's much easier for a leader if it's going to be a um, uh, a, a situation where the rails is at least okay, if not better. Um, yeah, so they went five lengths below sort of average. So yes, that is a um, that that makes exact a lot of sense as to why people would want to back for tests. Like it's it's going to get a soft lead. Yes, it's got race fitness, mm. and it's um yeah it's up and running. Which and it's a heavy ten track. So I guess what I would say, looking at at that market, is that um I mean if you backed if you backed for tests at you know four eighty or five dollars or what was it come jump time at race morning three eighty. So there's a the, lot of fluctuations. There. Yeah, like there's yeah, crazy flux. After the scratching, after like, scratching three. If you took three eighty or whatever you took, Mark, that's just a fantastic bet. You will win making that bet long term. And if you backed all all say it's Eve, um, you know, early on or at the at the at the jump, like that's also a great bet. Like you, the, in the end of the day, it's too. It's almost like a um, a coin toss there, whichever mm. horse got its its nose down, and both punters are taking much better than even money. So. It's just a great example of there's always a good bet to be found in every race. If you get back every horse at certain points is going to be a good bet. Mm. Like that's really interesting. So he's saying, it, it, you know, Matt's saying there that it, it, it's just timing. Timing. The, the quality of the punter here comes down to timing, not taking yeah. odds on all Saints Eve, but knowing, hey, this runner might be taken, yeah, a be opposed. Let's back it late on Betfair. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Also, that's the way that race was run. Three, the three and the six there, you back both those horses, they're great bets. It's not, to me, it doesn't matter which horse got his nose down there. Mm. Um, it was 50 50. Yeah. All Saints Eve has done a great job to overcome the slow tempo and the heavy track. Mm. But um, if you took 480 or um, 380 for test, that's a fantastic bet. Mm. And you'll, you'll get that nose, you know, one in three times yeah. or one in two times, perhaps. But you could even um, uh, make it simpler than that. You could take a position at the uh, the two minute mark, let's say, where you know you've seen that move on Vitesse, and Vitesse is offering itself as a lay opportunity at that point, mm. uh, and lie and, and and vice versa. The uh, the All Saints Eve is offering itself as a as a as a back opportunity mm -hmm. at that point. So, it's um, 
basically you've got all that market intelligence to um, to sit there. You've already you've already done your form, and <clears throat> and you're you're able to say, well, I think the market has overcorrected here. Mm. You know, it's it's tripped over itself because these moves do get amplified um, because of the nature of um, of wagering. You know. Um, People many players, play. many players over better firm or an under better are blower. Yeah. Mm. And so, yeah, what would your advice be there? To, uh, again, I think a, a key pearl or point for a young form analyst or someone, how much do you respect the blow on Betfair? Well, you need to know why it's blowing, really. I, I mean, that's, that's what I set out to do most days. Um, so I'm sitting there, I'm watching Betfair keenly. I'm watching, uh, you know, I've already seen what's happened in the early markets. And so I'm trying to make sense of well, the way the market is trending. And if I'm confident, uh, well, there was a good example a few weeks ago in Kiss the Bride when uh, it won uh, over 1,800 metres, uh, Jay McDonald on again. Mm. Um, and it was a situation where I was aware that it had a poor parade. Yes. And so we watched that horse go from $3 to $4.60 after the parade. And, and because you know, there were the yard watchers were coming back. I was at the races. They were coming back going, oh God, this horse is you know, doing this wrong and it's doing that wrong. You understand why it's blowing. And if you know why it's blowing, then you can bet a lot more confidently than if you don't know why it's blowing or conversely firming. Yeah, great. I think we'll move on to later in the card, race seven. Um, so we've just seen an example in race one where the market has, has got it wrong, but hasn't got it wrong. It was heads up, heads down. It was sort of, we're saying it's all about timing really yeah, for that race. Yeah. There was nothing... Yeah, nothing was back of it. The market didn't really get it wrong. No, no, it's just it's just the it's market that, direction. that late, yeah, that late betfair mm -hmm. point at which horse to back is it, just yeah, it's just that's just changes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I understand. So we're moving now to race seven, uh, number two, North Pacific. So I know it was a, it was a pretty well tipped horse, like mm -hmm. in, in the media. Again, it's got Barry One, it's got J Max. So you know, Twitter's tipping it up a storm to the subscribers, mm -hmm. uh, and but we saw. Yeah, I guess the syndicates, or we say that the two minutes, the, the really late push. And I know that there was a stack of money for this horse. Um, yeah, there, there was heavy weighting uh, wanting to back this horse. Yeah. Um, I, I, did, the, did the firm surprise you, Mark? Uh, it telegraphed. This was, a, uh, this was a situation where I wanted to see a move against this horse because my position was, wasn't particularly pro this horse. But... Yeah. So what I saw, I, I, I looked at the Betfair market at 9.30 a.m. and there was a lot of interest, a lot of early interest for 9.30 a.m. It's, you know, it's, mm. it's rare to see that. And then I looked at this market after either race one or race two when we sort of started to worry about the inside. You know, the, the riders had already, it's, the, the riders had already um, made their move out to the outside fence. And I was, I was thinking, I wonder what's happened to this horse. And sure enough, there was two thirty. So all that activity at the at the two dollars, the two oh five, the two ten, yeah. had been scooped up. And I went, "Oh, that's interesting." But once we came, uh, once race six had been run, and we returned to this market, I, I see. I, I I noted that that had uh, reverted to the original, and I went, "Wow, that is a." Um, that's a strong push for this horse. They've, uh, you know, the, the, the backers have come in, swooped in again and, um, and asserted uh, the, the, the dominance of this horse. Yeah, quite interesting. I mean, it's a pretty intelligent analysis there of what's happened, but again, also points to the intelligence of the, the, the Betfair landscape. I mean, there, there was, you know, they noticed there could have been a potential uh, query. Yeah, through the day, yeah. it was validated probably less of a concern and the market responded. So you've got to be really on your game, don't you, if you're back in this horse? Yeah, well, you do. But um, I think in this case, the I guess the guys that control sort of Betfair Lathe or whatever, mm. um, you have to look at, okay, which way are we going to turn? Mm. And, um, you know, you had like a sort of David Payne sort of you know, stable there. You had, um, you know, I mean, who did, yeah, Marcinet had some sort of form, you know, out wide and, there was nowhere really to go. And obviously, you know, those that have sectionals and stuff built into their form section mm. would see that what North Pacific did on um, first up or on day, uh, first up was just um, off the charts. Mm. So you're and saying uh, figures dominated this bet? I think so. I think, yeah, it comes to figures are a certain point in mm. the marketplace. And um, yeah, this horse had um, cracking over all time from what I can see on, on my stuff. 
um, yeah. almost like a six length advantage um, ability wise. Yeah, that's not necessarily um, always true. It's just what the figures say. Mm. Um, and then once they went looking everywhere else, they were like, "No, nah, this is this is our go to play." And as you say, all those guys that um, just do the form. Um, manually and visually mm. would also see how impressive more specific was to the eye last start so um let's watch a replay yeah let's see what happens <laughs> what number is north pacific um it's number two it's the one on the just jump well on the fence mm -hmm. um so yeah barrier one uh yeah taking a, a little sit and very close to the um very close to the leaders so you know i guess you would say from a video point of view now if, if it runs it's you know minus eight or minus ten sort of sectional sprint it should put these away easily um based on last start and um i guess that's what happens eventually mm. mark what are you thinking here through the race are you busy <laughs> Mark's gone. <laughs> Mark's gone. <laughs> but um, yeah, I mean, look, uh, Marcinet is getting a very easy lead, uh, the seven there. Mm. Um, it's obviously jockeys sort of going wider on the track. And look, a bit of credit here with North Pacific being held up. Um, gets out now nicely. But it does need to knuckle down to win this race. Yeah, it? yeah. Like it doesn't have too much momentum. That tiny little bit of being held up on a heavy track is a really tough thing to overcome. Uh -huh. yeah. And uh, here we go. Mark's back. And uh, yeah, look, J Mac finds the best part of the track. Gone from game. inside barrier to the um, outside part of the rail. Um, look at that, it's a top wing, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. This, this horse has scope to improve, you know. Mm. Um, given a wider draw or something next side, it could run even better. But um, yeah, I guess, yeah, I guess for me, there was just nowhere else to turn in that race. And mm. um, regardless of, you know, 230, whatever it got out to, was it mm. anyone that was canny enough to start chipping in at that price? Having you, you've got an absolute massive overlay there from a percentage point of view, it's a great bet. But taking 230 about a horse that starts a dollar 95 on the exchange is just it's just so good. That's a great, that's the perfect bet you can have because mm. you can get those, you know, you get your turnover up a lot on those sort of bets. Yeah, I think also, and I'm, I, I guess this isn't really related to what you're doing, but I will just comment if there is anyone in this session like, you know, when I say recreational customers, I mean someone that might bet on a Saturday, but knows what they're doing. Yeah. Right? They look at Betfair. Yeah, you know, you've got the boost option. Like we look at like Ned Sportsbet. The, mm. the guys that you know, have those accounts, yeah. they do exist. We're not going to, you know, if, yeah. if you've got those accounts, like this, this horse is rock solid. Yeah. There's so much value if you do have access to those accounts in boosting this to 210, 215, mm -hmm. two minutes before the race, as opposed to trying to pick one out, pick one, you know, in the morning. Yeah. When you're betting into high percentages, so mm -hmm. it's one thing I would say to, to any clients that I work with that do have these, mm -hmm. you know, have access to accounts like that. Look for these types of runners to to ask, you know, yeah. to take advantage of the spoils, which you know you might be but given. To me, the, the two thirty on Betfair is a boost, mm -hmm. a boost in itself. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and yeah, it's exactly. available to everyone. As yeah, well. but you're right; you can back those and boost them, and then lay them back. Lay them back. Yeah. yeah. Sure. All right, we there, might move. There is the... a pearl uh, that, uh, yes. that comes out of this race. It's um. <clears throat> So if you uh, examine the first favourite versus the second favourite versus the third favourite, if you do see softness in the second favourite, that is going to point to two things that, uh, and, and I should mention also, if you see money for the third favourite, and in mm. this case, this horse was very well tried and it wound up third favourite, Bravado, yeah. that actually puts pressure on the second favourite and takes pressure off the first of the first favorite so you're likely to see the favorite quite firm if you're seeing support for the third favorite whereas if you see support for the second favorite that is when the pressure goes onto the favorite okay yeah that's good i haven't thought about i haven't thought about that before interesting link there i definitely see what you're saying regards well to it's basically saying if, if, if they are supporting the third favorite they've they've considered the second favorite and gone wider that's the weak link. Yeah, yeah, that's the weak link. Okay, that's, that's very good. I like it. Little pearl from Mark. Yeah, I think we might look for some examples in later sessions and explore that. I think it's a. I think it's really interesting. Good point. Okay, let's move to the twenty second, which was last week. Uh, and I just want to see an example of often on Twitter you see like they know yeah. and this concept of bet fairitis or you know something you know suspect with the race or you know something sinister and, you know everyone sort of jumps at shadows a, a bit i just want to see, show an example where you know a soft horse 
uh, in Frosty Rock. So Rambert Grace 3, number 3, Josh Parzon, uh, Barrier 2, Bjorn Baker, you know, in form at the moment. Um, yeah, this horse is, yeah, at $6, pretty soft. Um, and then we'll watch the replay. I guess, do you guys recall the race? Hmm. Uh, yes, I do. It's, what do you uh, think of the pre-race looking at Betfair? It's definitely not one that they're steaming into. I, 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 thought, it was, I thought it was solid enough. Um, it was was fairly well e- evenly distributed, uh, the, the Betfair market here. There, there were, um, I suppose the pre-race announcement of tactics on Rothenberg meant that... Uh, uh, there was a bit of resistance to him. Uh, it seemed to be that um, New King was an easing favourite and that um, this is so, seemed to have a lot of fans. Mm. I, I guess my point is a horse that is a leader, mm-hmm. it's inside, it's got a good jockey on it. Um, why is it not off the map? Or why is it not firm? Yeah, well, I, like, I think... The important thing to remember is there's just so many variables that go into these models that can, these big punting syndicates that um, jump onto Betfair, especially late. And you just don't know every one of them. Mm. So there's no, like, you know, it, logically you can look at that race and say, well, Frosty Rocks led in a pretty strong pace last start mm. against the favourite New King. Mm. And I think it got run down in the last 50 metres. I think it finished third. Okay. Logically, you could say, well, the map says this should get a just as easy a lead, and you might be able to hold off New King. Like you can say that in, in revision, but why some why the models didn't jump on and the big syndicates didn't jump on Frosty Rocks mm. that day? To, to I mean, if you do that race in hindsight, Mark, I'm not sure what you'd, you'd mark. Um, the Frosty Rocks. Yeah, well, look, you get, um, watch the video. It gets the easiest run ever. There's no pressure at all. Mm. Um, and you could reprice that horse extremely short, but there's just so many different things. There's something in this is so that the syndicates liked, yes. and the big punters liked. Oh, okay. Um, I, you know, it didn't come up with to me in regards to sectionals or video watching, but mm-hmm. they've seen something, and it yeah. can it, they can be so simple sometimes. It could be jockeys and barriers, there. like it's something that you wouldn't think of. Mm. Let's watch the race and go from here. So we need to go back here, race four. Twenty-second. Do you remember where you marked that horse, uh, Mark? What was? Yeah, I marked it five dollars, but I did have it favourite at five dollars. Oh, favourite at five dollars. Okay. And that's um where it's jumped, hasn't it? Twenty-second. There it is. Yeah. Okay, so let's watch this race. So number three, Frosty Rocks, is the horse in question. Let's click there. So yeah, jump just straight to the front. Straight to the front. Um, New King, the horse, is the favourite's last. You can see it in red. It um, has to give it, it beat it convincingly last style. I guess convincingly in regards to the last couple of, 50 metres, it sort of put a couple of lengths on it. Mm. I guess my query with, with this is I, I look at this race as someone who doesn't do the form and very sort of uneducated uh, punter. I want to see, I, I would expect Frosty Rocks to just be everyone's all over it and then no one would want to be on the ferry that gets back. Like you see great horses that get back but they just get to extraordinary prices on Betfair. Yeah. Um, and I, guess I, like, I think I think this is the exception that proves the rule, Luke. Yeah, okay. Uh, so, I mean, yes, typically that would happen. This hasn't happened on this occasion, but it's a, it's a rare event. Okay. Mm. And it's, it just shows that, you know, if you're, once again, a, a canny punter, you know your form, you may do speed maps and stuff like that, you can say at a certain point, I need to be backing Frosty Rocks on Betfair at 580. Mm. Yeah. Oh, this horse is going to give me a great run for my money. Like if you, you const- can be up there. If you concentrate on Sydney racing and, and you can, well, I don't. I have a very broad um, way I do my form, and I don't spend that much time on that. So mm. it's probably not my cup of tea. Yeah. But if you are really hands on, you're mappy. Mm. You see the way the track's playing. Um, there's no reason why you shouldn't be chopping into the 580, the 560 on Betfair, of course. And as you can see, um, everyone left it alone. And um, the race. and yeah, New King, I think last start, the horse in red was able to sort of track it up the fence. This time from its draw, 
they had to come really wide. And you know, I, I suspect that the change of track has um, fooled many. I mean, Randwick Ram- Ram- can be a great track to lead, uh, but because Frosty had been racing at Rose Hill, had Nash on last time and and complete control and wasn't able to get that type of break on the flat track at Rose Hill. If you saw there, Frosty Rocks basically skipped on top of the rise. So Frosty got to the top of the rise a couple of lengths before the other horses and was able to um, to, to come down the hill um, at that point and really establish a margin that put all the other horses to the sword. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, like yeah. If you watch the tapes last start and those two horses running against each other, like you know, like I watched the tape, I didn't sort of say, "Well, I'm going to back Frosty Rocks next start." It doesn't jump off the page. But if you did your maps and realised I was going to get a, a softer run, you could easily make the argument they could turn around. But it definitely wasn't one that I backed. But you know, people could mark mark mm. the favourite. Yeah. We might, we've, we've come to, that's an hour. Uh, thanks so much for your time. I think we might spend five minutes just running through some quick questions. Is that okay, Mark? Yeah, go for it. Yeah, great. Um, not sure if relevant, but the reason for Australian Betfair being split from the main business. Well, I think uh, it's just a commercial decision and it was bought by Packer, you know, some years ago and, and brought to Australia. So I think it's not really one I can answer that accurately. I'm not involved in the commercials, but... No, no. Yeah. Oh, I, look, I suspect that Betfair UK are uh, you, you, you cast cast the others you know you're on your own <laughs> yeah the convicts, the convicts, yeah. The convicts. <laughs> great um arthur says generally speaking what do the big syndicates really hone in on during the last two minutes a horse that is five dollars throughout betting and then bang a uh, has eight dollars there for the way of around five dollars throughout betting yeah bang it's a 380 it can happen it's big big money can move late yeah i think it's um it's a Certainly, it's a combination of a lot of things, but um, I think the maps is a really important one. I, I think they like fitness and being up on speed. Mm. General is a very generalised comment, mm. whereas you know I like horses that get back and, and run run home. Mm. You know, so there'll be those horses generally get a pose late, and those that that are on speed generally um, get back late. That's very general. There's so many different things. Mm. Mark, what do you think? What's your biggest key indicator of a syndicate go? Look, um, they also, they have some sort of influence from the parade as well. So that's, um, you know, so not only does the volume tend to be in the last few minutes anyway, but that also coincides with a time where all the the information is in. Mm. Um, So, but certainly I, I think they have fashions um, if you imagine they sort of have like a rolling algorithm where various factors will be seen as bettable at various mm-hmm. times, yeah. and that may change over the course of some weeks and some other factor may be perceived to be have, have an edge. And because of the, I suppose, the, the, the advent of super computerization, these are able to be you know, constantly monitored and updated and taken advantage of. So Matt mentioned, you know, there's a myriad of factors, um, and, but at any given time, any one factor may be under bet. And that's why I think they're, try- they're seeking to, to utilise. Yeah, I think in later, ser- in later, in later episodes um, of the Prologue series, we are going to have people from syndicates um, on here and discuss how they approach it. Um, I'm tipping they won't give away all the herbs and spices, <laughs> Um, but they're definitely going to talk about, you know, some of the things that may be misconceived or understood by syndicates. So looking forward to those episodes. But the funny thing is that if they did actually, you know, give a little bit more, um, uh, a little bit more intel, they would find that the punters that they're educating would be betting up. And that would mean that uh, there'd be fresh opportunities for their, their own methods to mm. find other holes in the market. The bigger the market, the, the probably the more opportunity the more likelihood of holes yeah nice uh benjamin fit says what can we do to increase pre-race liquidity will something like a zero percent common bets play before 9 a.m race day be an effective measure to stimulate early markets would this possibly attract some big plays into the market or the market makers i think it's an interesting comment it's something at betfair we're working tirelessly on we're continuously finding and working with new customers to seed markets yeah i guess this question sort of goes to why is it so hard to seed markets in australia well, uh, you're just going to have to give some sort of um, kickback to uh, to someone that's prepared to take those risks. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's if I can uh, hark back to um, 
earlier days of uh, just you know the the, the 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 betting activity on track most betting rings someone would reluctantly put up the market and they'd put up 150 percent and what would happen was it would take a long time for any activity to happen in that market as the bookies gradually found their way down to a um some sort of workable percentage for both punters and bookies whereas when you did have someone with a bit of flair and risk-taking appetite that would put up 115 percent you would find that the market would get into gear much more quickly you know, suddenly there was, there was, um, you know, and, 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 you know, it was a situation where those risk takers were taking quite big risks because um, they would have to let players on to win 5,000 at those um, prices and have to hope that their book would be large enough to cover the mistakes that they'd obviously make in putting up that sort of market. So, the, the the corollary will be that you know anybody that's prepared to take risks in the um in the early stages of a betfair market will have to have quite a large tank mm. and perhaps be in some way find an opportunity for reward for, for taking those risks yes yeah, it's, it's to re to answer the question it's something we really are working on a betfair all the way up from the ceo it's something we discuss regularly to to talk about uh, and we're doing, you know, we've got multiple different measures. Um, so it, it will only improve. Um, but I think it's important to remember it is, it's really tough. Um, it's, it's not an easy exercise. Well, I mean, it, 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 you know, it, it, if you can imagine a world of zero com, then yeah. you, know, you would find, you know, the, the whole thing would be liquid a lot earlier. Hmm. Uh, Marcus says, in your opinion, has the extreme wet weather nationally this year over the, over the last four months had a major impact on outcomes? Mark Lamborn? Well, I'm I'm not uh, I'm not casting much of an eye over um, venues outside of New South Wales, but I would say that it, yes, it's been very wet, and yet there haven't been random results. They've um, they've been results you can make sense of. Um, the market seems to be quite screwed down on on the likely uh, state of play. I, re I recall when I first got into racing that uh, results in these sorts of circumstances seem to be far more random. I, I think we've, as punters, we've got a much better handle on how these things play now. Yeah, I mean, I think Mark's probably, he thinks a bit different to everyone else. So he probably does put extra value in horses that are race fit and can go forward and stuff mm. like that. So I think for someone who's quite sort of savvy they probably haven't noticed too much because they've also adjusted their betting. Mm. But if you were just, you know, if you were just an old school type punter to just back things off trials and stuff like that, you'd probably be hurting a little bit more. Mm. Um, you know, we also funny you say old school on that because I would describe yeah, those yeah, as new school. school. Yeah. yeah, well, okay. Yeah, you're yeah, new school then, you could say. But um, yeah, we don't know what's happening with training tracks and stuff like that mm. and what horses aren't getting worked and stuff like that. So, um I don't have the data to say that, but I definitely would say it's having an effect on results. Yeah, that's a look, I, I, I take I your point. Mark, definitely take Mark your point. To adjust as well. Yeah, thanks. Uh, Mark says, what percentage of the market do you think syndicates take up volume-wise on the exchange? And do you believe in the biggest teams, syndicates, the sole controls of SP on the exchange? Um, yeah, it, it's interesting. I don't have the data in front of me, but I would say that, you know, the biggest syndicates in the world are betting into every market. And um, Tiffany, if you've bet in you know, more than one race on a day, you are betting against, you know, most likely you're betting against a syndicate for sure. Um, mm. I think they, they form a big part of the market and they do determine SP. I don't think it's Matt Taylor yeah, determining it? SP. Definitely uh, not. Out of Kenzo. Um, no, definitely not. <laughs> uh, we just don't know. It's just the great yeah. mystery of... Who is they? But yeah, exactly. Mm. The great mystery of um, being punters and we just don't know where the money is. You don't see who does what on Betfair. You don't see who's playing the totes. Mm. Um, we don't know. But, uh, I mean, yes, I think especially late on um, late, not maybe the country stuff, but, um, yeah, I think late it's all, I don't know what percent is the syndicate money, but um, can't you give us some tips? <laughs> I can't. I want to have a job. Well, after it's quite simple that because it's the only place to take a position against a horse, then they're you know clearly going to use that opportunity, and um, it's the it's the place to play. I think I, like I used to hear, hear you know old school style bookmakers talk about they making a lot of money out of opposing radio tipsters. Uh, we're talking like you know even mm. pre betfair days. Does that phenomenon of the public money? creating unders still exist or do you think the market's too sharp to say okay um duffy duffy's tip this up on sky channel so 
it's going to be under like does that happen anymore well, so no, no one pays uh, the sort of attention to the opening tote prices that they used to, because, you know, bear in mind, once upon a time, the only market that most people had seen 30 minutes out from the race was the, was the tote approximates. Okay. So they'd be very, very focused on that. Whereas nowadays we're looking at markets from Wednesday and fixed odds markets. Um, so I think there are pockets of um, uh, places yeah. where... Uh, the market overreact. So a, a good recent example is Lizzie Jelf's following. So mm -hmm. recently she's developed a strong following once she's posted her um, pick of the yard. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So you will find, you will, let's say she, she, she tips something that's $12. You will find that horse it might go $12 into $8. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm sure there's a syndicate there hungrily waiting for that information, ready to lay that horse at the $8. Cause clearly that's an over, you know, that's an overreaction. Mm. Um, you know, it, uh, it's, it's, it's an opportunity. Uh, yeah, and that's, it's that's, what, yeah, it's definitely an asset for, yeah, I think, I think at different times during the week that the tippers out there affect the, affect the fixed odds prices. Mm. And, um, whether it's, you know, the guys that do the Thursday shows on sky and get on, et cetera, whether it's the radio stuff in the morning, I think you'll see, you know, influences at that certain time. And then once someone else tips something, it influences someone smart back something and influences. And then at the end, all the computers and the algorithms get, get back churning again and it um, returns it back to a, what they consider the correct market. But yeah, yeah it's called reversion to mean. Reversion to mean. Yeah, great. Okay, I think we're going to wrap it up there. We've answered a, a stack of questions. We've had a really good uh, discussion. This is episode one. We're going to grow from here. We might get you guys back on perhaps a little bit of a debate with someone that does a form differently, you know, we might uh, see that conversation take place, but I'd like to thank you, Mark Lamborn. Thanks, Matt Taylor. And thanks to everyone that's uh, joined in. Feedback's welcome. Yeah. Pleasure. Thank you. Thank you all. Good luck. Get on the fair. Uh, we're doing everything we can to grow the game uh, and work in a pretty tough environment at the moment. So thanks everyone. And uh, looking forward to the weekend.